So join me, if you will, Luke chapter 12, and we start reading with verse 13, 13 to verse 21 of Luke 12. Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. Then he spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that you are the God who supplies all our need according to your riches and glory in Christ Jesus. I thank you that you are a God who, the true and living God, who is so graciously and so merciful and so about in such abundance have blessed us. And Father, you give people life, you, you, you create, you sustain those who recognize that, those who don't. And Father, in our time here today, as we look at Luke's gospel, we listen to Jesus' words, we find this warning and this warning about considering what our life consists of and this warning of not being greedy and not being covetousness not living in covetousness God I pray that your word and your spirit will examine our hearts today show us where we're at in this show us if we're living in contentment or if we are living in covetousness Father, help us to see that though our bodies are mortal, the soul is not. Help us to see what true riches really are. And all for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. I've been thinking about this a lot this past week. It's a topic that comes to mind often. And that is, what gives life worth? What gives life worth? When you look at it, of course, the world has a different viewpoint, a different standpoint of what gives life worth than what God's Word does. In fact, we see that term, and we hear that term, especially in today, it's a worldly term, and that is net worth. What is your net worth? It's defined this way, a term, a term that this materialistic temporal world uses but net, net worth is the value of all assets minus the total of all liabilities. Or put another way, it's net worth is what is owned minus what is owed. And I'm thankful in thinking about that. At least I'm a little bit in the black. I might not be far in the black. The wife and I may not be far in the black, but we're in the black. Thankful for that. But that's in terms of this world net worth. And Jesus in verse 15 makes it very clear that we're to take heed and beware of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. And yet that's exactly how the world views worth is what one possesses. So here we see another warning that Jesus gives. And really we need to take some time to consider his words. I want you to consider who is saying them. Who is saying them in our study today? We need to consider Jesus' words. He's the source of our teaching. 
here in this setting. We're also to consider the content. What is he talking about? He's talking about life and, and what gives life value. We also need to consider this, that our soul has no end. Life may have an end. More, our mortality, our physical life has an end. It has an expiration date, but our soul is eternal. In the parable that Jesus uses, he shows that the rich fuel or fool did not live with that mindset. He only lived for the here and now, the temporal so many people do the same. Consider. Consider Jesus' warnings. What did we see thus far? We, we hear him telling us to beware of hypocrisy. To beware of the religious leaders' hypocrisy. Their false teaching, their lifestyle. It was all a farce. It was all a sham. And he told us, he told his disciples, and as we read it, we're to take heed ourselves, we're to beware of hypocrisy. We also read that we are to be mindful and only fear the one who has final say, which we read in verse 5. Fear him who after he is killed has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. So that's, that's a warning that we need to beware of being fearful of man and not being fearful of the one who has final say which is God to me that's a warning so today we see a new warning a, a new beware a hey you need to listen you need to be watchful you need to be mindful and that is on this matter of one's life what does one's life consist of? What does it consist of? Well, when we look at this, and I have to be, be, I have to be mindful that we don't have PowerPoints today, so I won't be asking Eric or Caden to switch, and I have to just also remember that you're not seeing them up there, and so I'm going to try to stay more right with our text today than giving a lot of supporting verses. I entitled this Contentment in Christ, and that may be an odd title when, when it's talking about the, the parable of the rich fool. But what we see in this parable is, is greed. We see greed, we see selfishness, and we see foolishness. And I want to encourage people to be content in Christ instead of, of living in covetousness. Well, let's look at the story and what, and what transpires. So he's teaching. Remember, there's thousands, possibly ten thousands uh, gathered, verse 1 of chapter 12, innumerable multitude. And his popularity is at the highest, if you will. And as that popularity grows, of course, the religious leaders, the Pharisees, are being more and more angered and wanting to take Jesus out. He's revealed them. He's revealed their hypocrisy. The crowds continue to grow, though. Through his teaching and through his miracles, uh, the crowd desires to see him, desires to hear him, desires to be uh, healed. But in verse 15, we see something odd take place. In verse 13, it says, Then one from the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. I think that seems rather random. But when you think about it, uh, historically speaking, uh, calling him a teacher, rabbi, the, the rabbis in the past would take care of matters like this. They'd have the authority. They could give the direction. Jesus' response, though, clearly tells us that that is not the purpose of him coming to this earth. Look at verse 14. Man... Who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? Who do you think I am? You know, in my own thick thoughts, I thought, well, why did he come to Jesus? Because this is not fictional here in verse 13. The parable is fictional. 
It's a story laid alongside a principle, if you will. It's for the purpose of illustrating or driving home the point of what is being taught. But here, this is not. This is a real man comes out of the crowd and asks Jesus. Why would he ask Jesus? Well, again, he's very popular at the time. He speaks as one who has authority. The crowds are flocking to him. Hey, here's a guy who might be able to have some influence on my brother. The man's intentions, his motives, was to use Jesus just as a means to get what he wants. Greed works that way. Greed works that way. Jesus sets them straight. That's not why I came. Why did he come? Luke's gospel tells us Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. He came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom. That's why Jesus came. He did not come to be a judge. He did not come to be magistrate. In fact, that could have possibly got him in trouble with the Jews and even with the Romans of basically overstepping his boundary. So what he does do in this setting is he takes advantage. Jesus takes advantage of this teachable moment. That's how I see it. And really, it's a continuation of what he has already been teaching. Here's the master teacher taking this opportunity to now speak on this matter of what's really important in life and what really hinders life. And it is a continuation because when we get down to verse 22, uh, which Lord willing will be next week, the teaching about life continues. I say to you, do not worry about your life. Life is more than food. And so today's setting, though, is life is is not a matter of the abundance of what a person has. That's not what life is about. And so let's take a look at this matter of being aware of covetousness. What is covetousness? And when I thought about that and, and kept thinking about covetousness, and it's, a, it's defined this way, it's, it's greediness. It's every kind of greedy desire for more. It's holding on to and desiring more. It's being eager for gain. Being eager for gain. I thought about covetousness. What does it do? What does greed do? And here's A, B, C, D of what greed does. Greed fosters an attitude of anxiety. Follow that? When you're all about more, 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 more. That type of attitude lends to anxiety. Because the more you have, the more you have to be concerned about. And the more you have, the more you want. And so those two things of wanting more and being concerned of what you already have causes anxiety. Greed. Greed's an attitude of anxiety. It, it blinds. It, it blinds up us of what is important. And then it also binds us. It holds us, which the letter C captivates. It, it captivates us and it consumes us. This is what greed does. It captivates our thoughts. It holds us captive of, of wanting more, more, more. Greed is deceptive. It's deceptive. Because it, it tells us that if I just had a little bit more, then I would be content. I would be satisfied in life. That's deceptive. And then it's deadly. It's deadly, and we'll see that here in just a bit. Greed, the desire for more, 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 never being content. On any given day of the week, what, what, what is the contents of your heart? And what I mean by that is, is as you go through life, are you one of a person of contentment or are you a person of covetousness? 
a person who lives in contentment or discontentment, a person who is satisfied or a person who is unsatisfied. And that's why I want us to consider this thought of contentment with Christ because Christ brings contentment. If anyone be in Christ, he's a new creation. What that new creation is, the very life of Christ. And when we have the life of Christ, we have all that we need. We'll get to that in a little bit. Go further on here this morning. I was thinking about coveting, coveting, coveting. And of course my mind went to the Ten Commandments. And one might say, well, time out right there. I'm not under the Ten Commandments. Let me tell you. The spirit of the law, the moral law of God is, as the prophet says, Jeremiah, it's written upon our hearts. The new cre creation, the new crea uh, creature in Christ has the law of God written on our heart. I'm not talking about the ceremonial law. I'm talking about the very spirit of the law, the law of God written on our hearts. And throughout the scripture, we see warnings about coveting. We see warnings about greed. Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And I thought, well, that's easy. My neighbors don't have ox, and they don't have donkeys. And to my knowledge, they don't have any servants either. But of course, we understand what about their house? What about their vehicle? What about what you believe they have in way of assets? And the reason God's word commands us not to covet is because it is deadly. Greed can and does consume us. Like what the psalmist said, a little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. Talking about being content. God's word also tells us in the proverb, he says this, better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure with trouble. You see, God's word is always directing us to be content with what he has provided for us. And to beware of covetousness, to beware of greed. Let me just read a few verses to you. I, I thought even clear back to when Moses had too much on his plate, and so his father-in-law gives advice. Hey, you need some help, Moses. So you need to get some good godly men around you. This is paraphrase, of course. But, but the requirements, you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. We see that in 1 Timothy 3. We see that in Titus 1, given the same parameters, if you will, the same guidelines, the same requirements for, for overseers of the church. That they're not to be greedy for gain. Why such warning? Because there's such a tendency to do it. It's just, uh, we're just naturally inclined to want more and to not be content. God calls us not to be that way. And I will tell you this, in the new creation, Christ in us, the hope of glory, the Spirit of God enables and empowers and helps you and I to fight against that tendency to want more, 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 and helps us to be satisfied and to be content with our lot in life. I truly believe that, that greed and, and discontentment is sin because it's a failure to trust God. That you don't really know my needs. You don't really know my wants. And you don't provide for that. That's a, that's a lack of faith. It's a lack of trust. But there is a tendency. Uh, Psalm 119 verse 36. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to covetousness. 
Why, why would he ask God to incline his heart to his word? Because there's that inclination, there's just that, that, that wandering and straying from God and to the things of this world and finding our worth. possessions he goes on to say turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way where this covetous covetousness this greed where does it come from it comes from within naturally we're children of wrath it, it's in us Jesus says from within of within out of the heart uh, of men proceed evil thoughts adulteries fornication murders thefts covetousness all these evil things come from within, and they defile man. So it's, it's in us, naturally speaking. And yet, we're not, to, we're not to fall to that. We're not to allow that to rule us. Throughout Romans, we see the same thing. Wickedness, covetousness, Romans 1.29. Paul says, I would not have known the law. I would not have known sin except through the law, for I would not have known covetousness unless the law said, you shall not covet. So the law is good. The word of God does reveal to us, hey, you're going to have a natural tendency to want more, 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 more. But I will help you to be content with such things as you have. Again, the Pharisees were, were, were just greedy. They just, they just hungry for money and greed. That's what the gospel tells us. Peter says in his second epistle, by covetousness, the false prophets, the teachers, they will exploit you with their deceptive words. We've got to watch greed. We, we've got to watch out. And that's why Jesus is saying, beware. Watch out for greed. Watch out for covetousness because one's life doesn't consist of the abundance of things he possesses and yet again the world says different doesn't it well let's look at this parable help us understand this so it says he spoke a parable so he, he's 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 putting this earthly story with a heavenly meaning as I heard it defined before he, he's taken something of everyday life laying it beside this 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 teaching this this principle that he wants to emphasize upon he says the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully there's nothing wrong with that do you realize that riches aren't wrong Abraham was rich. Job was rich. Throughout the New Testament, we see people that had wealth. But the wealth didn't have them. Do your possessions possess you? That's what's really the point here. There's nothing wrong with having, providing what you have doesn't hold your heart. The things that you do have, do you have a white knuckled grip on them or do you hold them with an open hand? Do we recognize the source of, of where they came from? We could say it was our hard work, I earned this. Yeah, well, who gave you breath? Who gives you life? Who gives you the ability? That's what we need to consider. Well, ground of a certain man, or a, a ground, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. Great. Great so far. Nothing wrong. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no more, I have no room to store my crops. There's just no more room. Look at this, and, and again, this is a this is fictional. This is a story. I understand, so we don't want to be too dogmatic or draw doctrines out of this. But but let's get what Jesus is saying here. He thought within himself, "Child of God, be careful with that." There's wisdom in counsel. Everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, right? 
We do a lot of thinking. We should. We need to think things through. But right alongside that thinking, you and I need to be praying about things. So he's just talking to himself. What am I going to do with this? There's no seeking God for advice that we read about here. What shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So as he ponders this, I know what I'll do. I will do this. Look at verse 18. I will pull down my barns, build greater. There I will store all my crops and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. Many scholars have pointed out, and I say many, have pointed out the eyes and the minds in this in this parable which does show us that this man was selfish he was greedy and he was foolish he's consumed with himself never once and again it's a parable I get it but never once what do I do with my excess what do I do with my abundance How could I perhaps be helpful to other people with this? Never entered his mind. And again, it's a parable. But the parable tells us what it is like for the greedy person. What it is like for the person who, who does not live in contentment but lives in covetousness instead. A person whose heart is all about the things of this world, the temporal fleeting treasures of this life, instead of the eternal value of the things of the kingdom of God. New life in Christ and the kingdom. Well, he says to himself, now, this is what I'll do. And then I'll be able to take it easy. This man, if you will, planned for the future but only to an extent. I've been giving this a lot of thought too. People pre-plan their funerals, pre-pay their funerals, even for the burial plot. I don't see anything wrong with it. I, I don't. But that's only planning so far into the future. Because you and I have an eternal soul. To stop there with our plans for the future is foolish. And that's exactly what this man did. He gave no regards to the fact. In fact, it's interesting to me that Jesus uses the word soul. Look at this. I will say to my soul, soul. Soul, you have many goods. Laid up many years. Take your easy drink to marry. God said to him, Soul, this night your soul will be required of you. And then whose will those things be? Things with, by which you have provided. Who, who do they go to then? So let's look about this matter of soul. What is a soul? As you see it de defined in, in the Greek language, it's a vital force, that which animates the body. Okay? It's the part that makes us a living being. Uh, the soul is another facet of life, another essence which differs from the body, and it's not dissolved by death. Did this rich man believe that? No. No. And again, it's a fictional story, but those who only live for this world, there are plenty. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, and so there are plenty who, who just conclude, there is no God. Therefore, there is no heaven, there is no hell, there is no future beyond this life. And that's what they bank on. This is what this, the fool here in this parable was banking on. Are you banking on that? Are you banking on all there is is this life and there's nothing more? How do you know that's so? And what do you do with the fact that God's word tells us differently? Again, consider the source. Jesus is speaking here. 
in this setting. What else is the soul? Well, the soul, by God's grace, attains its highest end through eternal blessings. You and I, in our soul, get to experience new life in Christ. We get to experience God, a relationship with Him. We get to experience the fruit of the Spirit in this life, which is which doesn't even come, nothing in this world even comes close to comparing to the blessings that we have in Christ. The anxiety, attitude of anxiety, the, the blindness, the, the binding power, the captivating and consuming, the deceitfulness and deadliness, all that is gone through the blessings of the new life of Christ within. So the soul is the means in which we experience new life in Christ. Now our soul is eternal. And this man was banking only on life being the morning. And so I will live. Here's what I'm going to do. And this is what people do day after day after day. They think their net worth is how much money is in the banking account. How much stuff they have acquired. And their future plans, they may be living or leaving a large sum behind for the family to fight over when it's done. They may have everything paid for, the funeral, the plot, everything. However, they have no plans beyond that. They don't take into consideration their eternal soul. And that's what Jesus is pointing out in this parable. Yes, the mentality of eat, drink, be merry goes clear back to 300 B.C. And through the years, we've adapted that. You only go around once. You only have this life. Only one life to live. Might as well live it up and enjoy everything I can. And that's how uh, the majority of people go through life. does God's word say to that? God's word says that's foolish. That's foolish. So, verse 20, but God said to him, fool, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The fool lives as if there is no God. The fool lives for the things of this world, thinking there is no eternity. That's how a fool lives. Fool, this this night your soul will be required. God will require your soul. Then, whose will those things be which you have provided? Then he says in verse 21, So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards the things of God. Now I want you to understand that Jesus isn't saying you can buy your way into heaven. That's not the point here. You can't buy your way into heaven, nor can you work your way into heaven. Salvation is a gift. It, it's, we are saved by grace through faith, that not of ourselves. The gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. But the true rich person are those who have the life of Christ within and who has eternal blessedness awaiting for them through faith in Christ. We're going to see this more as, as we continue on in this chapter. But, but we, heed the, or we hear the warning about laying not up for ourselves treasures here on earth where moth and rust corrupt, but where thieves break and steal, but instead to lay up our treasures in heaven. So we don't work our way into heaven, but if we've been saved from above, or saved, brought into God's family, have become a new creation of Christ, adopted into his family, join heirs with Christ. We have a heavenly, eternal inheritance awaiting for us. And everything we do 
for the glory and for his kingdom continues to add to those blessings that await us when we get to glory. And so some things to consider. Peter sa- or Paul says this, this matter of, of contentment in Christ. 1 Timothy 6, 6 through 8. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For, for we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can carry nothing out. Through the years I've ministered over or ministered funerals, celebrations of life, memorials. A lot of times I've seen things put in the casket. They're not taking them with them. I give a uh, a sentimental security piece of that being in there with them. But they're not taking it with them. And that's what Paul is saying. We can carry nothing out. Nothing Having food and clothing uh, with these, we shall be content. Learning that that life does not consist in the abundance of things he possesses. God's word tells us that in him we live and move and have our being. That's the value of life. That God gives life, God sustains life. Christ has come that we may have life, that we may have it in abundance. I thought I was living until I was born from above. And then to experience the blessings of joy and peace and contentment, of assurance, of of purpose and meaning, the world can't give you those things. All the world can give you is temporal, is fleeting. Somebody that has $190 billion and thinks he's going to live forever, that he's going to find and buy the fountain of youth. His soul will live forever because everyone's soul lives forever. And the one who lives only to acquire and to enjoy here in this fleeting life is the full. Because they have the rest of eternity to pay for that type of mindset. And they force fit the blessings of God and his kingdom and his blessings. Hebrews 13, 5 says this, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I don't know about you, but that gives my heart great comfort. Because the things of this world will forsake you. Anything that's visible is temporal. And it's fleeting. And it's going to pass. But our soul is eternal. There's no, there is a day of reckoning. There is a day of accountability coming for all people. We must understand that. But you see, covetousness and greed blinds our eyes from that. It keeps the focus on the here and now instead of looking to things of the future. And I don't mean the future here in this life, but eternity. That's why some time ago God condensed it down to this for my mind. Live continually, eternally minded. And and another little short thing. Live right by knowing Christ. Or how, how's it go? That, that, I'll, I'll just put it out there. Live right by knowing Christ. And so, the only way to be right in this world is to know Christ. And live ready. Here's it, here it is. And we're not stopping and starting again. Live ready by living right. Live right by knowing Christ. Then, I, then you don't have anything to worry about. Then when the day comes or the night comes, whenever that may be that your soul is now required of you, there's nothing to worry. 
We pass from this life to life eternal. John 5, 24. Well, Paul gave young Timothy some advice. 1 Timothy 6, 17, 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. And how many people are? But in the living God who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Verses 18 and 19. First Timothy 6. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what which is truly life. And that's what Jesus was pointing out to this, to this rich fool. He says, this night your soul will be required, your eternal soul, buddy. There is a day of reckoning. There is a day of accountability. There is a day when you're going to stand before the true and living God. Then whose are these things going to be? And Jesus says, that's foolish. So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. How are we rich towards God? Though we don't buy our way to heaven, let me wrap this up. How are we rich towards God? By recognizing every blessing that we have, we, we give him but thine own, right? He, he's the one who so, so abundantly... Uh, provides for us who who yes who 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 provides all our need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus and he he gives us so that we can be content and so that we can give for his glory for his honor for his kingdom you know People start talking about the tithe, and I, I get a little bit concerned, especially when Christians talk about it. I mean, that's typically who talks about it. Because a lot in, in hearing talk seems to, this seems to be a matter of obligation. And so I fulfilled this, now that's done, now this is mine, and this is what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And so. I've met the requirement, that's enough. The rest is for me, I'm living for me, I'm, 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 I'm investing for me. Well, remember, God gives us everything we have. And we are to invest in that which is eternal. Covetousness, greediness, keeps a person from doing that keeps a person from wanting to give in order to advance the kingdom you can't out give God you can't do that and so as you give of what he has blessed you with what he has asked you to be a steward of as you give back to him every time we do we are laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven so what what controls you what mindset do you live with does, does your possess, possessions possess you does your assets and your uh, material possessions are they a means of, of comfort? We've got to remember that God has given us all good things to enjoy. Let me, let me temper this. He has. And again, there's nothing wrong with riches. It's only wrong when possess, possessions possess us. Riches is where our hearts are at. It's not money that's the root of evil. It's the love of money. But taking the, and recognizing, God, you've blessed me with this, so now I want to bless others with this. That's, an, that's what investing in the kingdom of God is all about. That's what being rich towards God is all about. Let's pray.
Let's pray. Father, I pray that your spirit and your word will challenge our hearts on this matter. We live with contentment, we live with contentment, contentment in Christ. As a child of yours, realizing that all blessings come from you, that you entrust to us what we can handle, that you're not going to withhold any good thing from us, that it is your desire to give us the kingdom. Do we live in contentment with that? Or do we show a lack of faith and, and sin by being greedy, by being discontent, by being unsatisfied with your blessings upon us? God, I pray your spirit will challenge our hearts. Father, we need to hear the word full because of our behavior, because of how we are conducting ourselves, do so. Father, help us, chasten us, correct our thinking, correct our lives, and so that you would be glorified, that we would bring you glory and not shame by the way we live, by the way we think, by the way we invest. Use it all for your glory, God. We thank you and ask it in Jesus' name.